Thanks, Jessica, and thanks everybody for inviting me to Leeds. It's the first time I've been here, actually, so it's a, a, a new experience, but it seems like a very exciting and, and vibrant city, so I'm very pleased to be here, especially as my ancestors hail a bit further south from Rotherham in South Yorkshire, so particularly pleased to be here. Um, <coughs> really, during the centenary uh, commemorations, I guess as a historian of the West Indian experiences of the First World War, I've become increasingly uh, aware of how uh, West Indian participation in the First World War is re-entering the uh, popular imagination through uh, television, drama and documentary, and also increasingly uh, in dramatic uh, stage representations. It's a number of uh, plays, particularly for young people, theatre and education productions in which the West Indian experience of the First World War from a number of angles is, uh, you know, writers are, are in, and, and programme makers are in attempting to incorporate those experiences, I guess uh, partly in order to meet demand uh, and policy requirements uh, of, of broadcasting organisations and education authorities uh, particularly. So, I guess as a historian primarily, but also <laughs> as, a, as somebody who wor works in a media studies department, I'm trying to merge the historical memory uh, and, and see how that kind of fits with contemporary representation. So what I'm, I'm going to do this evening is touch a little bit on, on, um, on, on some of these contemporary uh, productions to see how they... Uh, address the experience of West Indians during the First World War before looking in a bit more detail at, uh, at what I would say is the continually shifting memory of, of the First World War from a West Indian uh, perspective. You know, in a sense, the, the West Indian volunteers who, who came forward in 1914 onwards, either in the Caribbean itself or West Indians resident in Britain when they came forward for war service, they were volunteers, every one of those uh, people was, a, was actually a volunteer rather than a conscript, they were volunteers for empire and over the course of time the, the, the kind of memory of their war service has been appropriated first of all within, within an imperial context, later within uh, the emergence of, of independent nationhood the, the war memory was appropriated by nationalists in the Caribbean and also at the same time also appropriated by people who had a far broader perspective that, that those people with a kind of pan-African outlook started to uh, in a sense appropriate the military service of West Indians uh, in the First World War to in a sense to their own ends or, although of course it's fair to say that West, you know, people ex-servicemen were involved in both nationalist and, and pan-African uh, movements in the course of the 1920s, 1930s and uh, beyond. And then, of course, many of the, I guess, descendants of some of those West Indian servicemen now find themselves living in Britain uh, as part of contemporary British uh, multicultural society. And, and, and in turn, the memory of the First World War, the... the, <coughs> the the, the memory of uh, West Indian service in the First World War is now being used by the descendants of those servicemen to stake a claim uh, to full uh, and equal citizenship I I in contemporary uh, British society. So I just wanted to kind of really reflect on, on, on those kind of historic shifts, although initially I just wanted to look at you know, how contemporary media are reflecting on, on some of these uh, processes. I think one of the things that kind of struck, struck me, first of all, when you know the BBC, I think, has uh, committed to something like two and a half thousand hours of programming about the First World War over the next four years. And one of the things that first strikes me about the BBC coverage is the way. I guess the more uncomfortable memories of empire are kind of erased 
to some extent, although as I'll explore in a moment, so you know that's not entirely the case, but certainly in terms of the large scale commemorations, you know, this is a, one, of, one of the processes that seems to me to be taking place is the kind of conflation of empire with commonwealth. In other words, you know, the, the way that, I guess, the, the uh, residue of imperial uh, rule is kind of remembered wi within, within services that commemorate uh, uh, the com what people now term the commonwealth rather the, than the imperial contribution to the First World War. And so uh, on the 4th of August earlier this year at Glasgow Cathedral, we had a televised service, which I've got, I've got a brief uh, 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 a screenshot here, where you have all, all the uh, military dignitaries from various former imperial countries lined up uh, to commemorate you know the, the the war services of of men who essentially enlisted for empire. They didn't enlist for Commonwealth, and they and they, <coughs> and they perhaps didn't enlist for the, those now independent countries. So you know, representatives from Australia, New Zealand, Cali Canada, uh, Ghana, uh, Jamaica, and so forth were represented at the service. Which you know, the the main, one of the main hymns or, or choral pieces is that were, were at the service was Peter Aston's choral piece. So they gave their bodies to the Commonwealth. I mean, I, th I think that's an interesting kind of re remembering of, of, of the First World War. It's this kind of, and of course, it's really harking back to Pericles' uh, uh, funeral oration. And I sh it's interesting that the translation he uses is Thomas Hobbes' translation in, of 1651 or thereabouts, when, of course, at that time, uh, there was what we might call the first Commonwealth established I I in Britain during the course of the English Civil War, although Hobbes himself was uh, very much an ardent uh, royalist. Uh, nevertheless, we can see where some of those words have their origins. Uh, they, 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 in fact, essentially predate empire they almost predate British settlement in, in the West Indies, for example. I think by that time, only Barbados had been uh, settled. Jamaica hadn't been acquired from the Spanish quite yet when uh, Hobbes, Hobbes translated Pericles' uh, funeral oration from, uh, through, from, uh, from the history of the uh, Peloponnesian uh, War. So I'm interested in those kind of historical Kind of dimensions. We're not only talking about the Commonwealth of Nations, we're also t talking about uh, a kind of Commonwealth uh, harking back really in, in, in essence to the 17th century also, and the notion of military sacrifice also for that Commonwealth, and the notion that people, when they, they give up their bodies, they, they give their lives for the Commonwealth, you know, that, that they will receive uh, unending praise, and that, you know, those who remain to live the tale and, and subsequent generations should forever be uh, grateful for that sacrifice. But as I say, I'm interested in that kind of uh, conflation, really, where perhaps the uncomfortable histories of empire uh, are kind of overlooked by saying, you know, this is all about Commonwealth and the Commonwealth of Nations, uh, you know, the contemporary relationships that Britain has with its former colonies that are purported to be far more equal than the old imperial uh, uh, relationships. <laughs> we were already started talking about the Crimson Field when uh, <laughs> Philippa and, and Chris took me for a coffee just beforehand, so <laughs> I, I, I stayed quiet, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> but um, I, I think what, what, what this, um, um, this particular uh, Screenshot shows this is a uh, private George Shoemaker is uh, rather improbably visited by his father Noah in the Crimson Field. You know the the, the BBC kind of showpiece uh, drama that was broadcast back in April, uh, which explored the lives of nurses on, on the uh, Western Front. Um, for me, for, for me, this particular. Uh, 
kind of uh, representation of the Caribbean soldier is particularly significant because you know he was one of the, I think he's the first black military character to appear in a dramatic setting at least in, in the BBC's uh, coverage uh, of the of the centenary. But stra rather ironically, or perhaps not so ironically, he's actually been wounded in the head, so he's unable to speak. So we just get poor Private George Shoemaker lying in bed, visited, as I say, rather improbably by his father. We're not sure how his father got there, if he sailed over from the Caribbean, or, or if he was perhaps already living in London. But more importantly was the sense that Private Shoemaker is unable to give an account of himself. Uh, we have no idea how he came to volunteer for the army. We have no idea whether he was a volunteer in the British West Indies Regiment or if he volunteered as one of the few black soldiers uh, living in London at the outbreak of war. We have no idea of that, 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 that story. So in a sense, Private Shoemaker becomes a kind of very one-dimensional character that you have to start asking, is he there just as part of a, a box ticking exercise about, alongside some of the other characters that appeared in the Crimson Field. We have the, the, the man struggling with his uh, gay identity, we have the shell-shocked man and we even have uh, I think uh, a, si a single mother, they kind of all appear, appearing as a kind of box ticking exercise. I mean that might be a slightly cynical view but I think if you're going to have characters in, in these kind of dramas that you, you need to have characters that are able to speak for themselves, that are able to perhaps answer some of the questions that I'm sure are on uh, uh, on the lips of the audience. You know, otherwise you get the typical Daily te Telegraph comment, this is just political correctness gone mad. You know, we've got these, you know, people who characters who are essentially wheeled on for no other purpose than to kind of satisfy some uh, policy of, of the BBC to say that it's addressing the needs of, of, of Britain's uh, multicultural society. And uh, as I say, <laughs> I'm, I'm perhaps a little bit cynical about it because I, my own, uh, over the course of the last few months uh, in the lead up to the centenary, you know, occasionally somebody from the BBC will contact me by email or phone me up and say, "We're trying to develop a character. We want, we must have a black character." And um, somebody contacted me; they wanted to produce a, a short uh, drama documentary about a tank crew in the First World War. And they said, "We want to have a black soldier. Is it possible that a black soldier could have served in a tank?" I said, "Well, actually, there was a black soldier who was awarded the military medal." serving in, you know, as part of the tank uh, crew. And, uh, and they said, what year did he serve in? And I said, well, he got his military medal in 1917. And they said, well, this drama's set in 1918. I don't think we can use him. And I said, <laughs> but it's that kind of, <laughs> it's that kind of, you know, and then there's a whole set, uh, I kind of, I'm, the other th issue that's, uh, that I haven't really got time to address today, but I think it's the nature of contemporary broadcasting where rather than people who've worked in broadcasting and on specific areas of, the, of BBC productions over a number of years, they're employees of the BBC, we have a increasingly freelance production companies who have interns and freelance researchers who essentially don't have an awful lot of knowledge of the programmes and, and the historical background that they're, they're supposed to be incorporating into their into their dramatic uh, productions. I mean, I think that's a, a real issue and you know, it kind of digresses into the way the BBC is funded and the, the whole privatisation and marketisation of broadcasting in Britain. But at the same time, those issues have an impact on the way we represent uh, characters and whether we represent them accurately and then whether we allow our characters to, to tell a kind of story. So that brought, in terms of broadcasting, as I say, I think there is this kind of process of box ticking to some extent and not allowing characters to explain how they came to be uh, serving for, for the Empire in 1914. Other 
Theor uh, theatrical productions, however, I think, you know, tend to be uh, far more imaginative. So here, this is a theatre, uh, and particularly in terms of theatre in education, that is, pro you know, dramas aimed at, at school age uh, young, young people. But the, this uh, particular image is, is from a play uh, by uh, Juliet Jilks that was uh, produced uh, at the Birmingham Rep in, in 2008. And this is at the gates of Gaza, which in a sense is far more concerned with about the soldiers articulating their, experiencing, uh, uh, articulating their experiences. And in fact, at the gates of Gaza... Initially, the opening scenes are in 1919, when, when the black soldiers are, being de are awaiting demobilisation in Britain and when they're uh, experiencing some of the racism that took uh, place in Britain in, in, the, in the race riots that uh, beset uh, London, uh, Bristol uh, and, and Liverpool and, and, the, and other cities such as Glasgow during the demobilisation uh, period. And these soldiers are ruefully really reflecting on how they, they gave their lives and they made sacrifices to serve Britain in the war, but were then on their homecoming, on the, on their, on the, on, on the stopover, on their journey back to the Caribbean, they're subject to, to uh, racist taunts and even attacks on the streets of, of various uh, cities uh, in, in London. It's particularly significant, uh, as I'll uh, explain a little bit later, you know, dealing with the West Indian service in, in the Middle East and campaigns in, in, in Palestine and Jordan, which have enormous biblical significance and, and are particularly potent images in terms of uh, you know the religious practices and ideologies of, of the Caribbean, the sort of millennial interpretations uh, of, of history that were are particularly in, significant and, in a sense, mean that. For West Indians, the, the First World War wasn't only about serving empire. It, there was a whole host of other reasons why people came forward to volunteer. And, and you know, imagining for a deeply religious man from the Caribbean liberating the Holy Land from the Ottoman Turk, you know, that that's, gives the war war service a whole new dimension. And as I say, this is something that the play at the gates of Gaza uh, attempts to address. This is from a theatre and education play that I went to see at Morden Hall in um, South London. And again, in fact, the makers of the play asked me, is it possible that a black soldier could have been in a military hospital in London because we'd like to have a, a black character? What was interesting, I mean, <laughs> this character, Sergeant Alex Forbes, actually has a voice in contrast to the... the uh, uh, private shoemaker in the BBC production, Alex Forbes, has a story. We have an understanding of how he came to volunteer. We have an understanding of his war service, even how he, he got injured uh, uh, carrying uh, shells uh, to the batteries on, on, on the front line. Uh, and the sense that he has a, a, a history that uh, also allows him... Uh, to talk about his experiences as, as, as a member of the Jamaican peasantry, as somebody who prior to the war uh, raised crops, had his own pot, plot of land and so forth back, back in the Caribbean. And that's what he left behind to, uh, to volunteer. So in a sense, a more rounded character, giving <coughs> at least some degree of insight into why uh, West Indians came forward uh, to fight uh, in, in the First World War. Another uh, play, this is the cast of Chiggerfoot Boys, and this is a play in, uh, in production. It's it, uh, I think the, the, this car, here the cast is rehearsing Chiggerfoot Boys, which is basically a play built around the experiences of the, of the Manley brothers from Jamaica, Norman Manley, who became uh, one of the first prime ministers of independent Jamaica, served in the First World War uh, as an artillery gunner and actually experienced... Uh, Racism. His brother Roy was actually killed alongside him uh, on the Western Front, which was something that he uh, reflected on up until uh, his death and was a very formative experience for him. Chiggerfoot Boys is a, is, an, uh, is a dramatic attempt to try and uh, 
deal with those and experiences and reflect on the full meaning of uh, of West Indian service in the second uh, in the in the First World War. Probably a, a character that some of, some of you may already be familiar with. Um, Second Lieutenant Walter Toll, who was a footballer uh, prior to the outbreak of the, the First World War, and in a sense he has almost become uh, a kind of cult figure in many ways. He's, he, he, I think partly because of, of a lack of understanding of the West Indian experiences in the First World War, the fact that you know people have located a, what, a, who appears to be a solitary black officer leading his men over the top, uh, during the First World War has become, uh, in, a, in a sense, has become a symbolic or a emblematic uh, figure. Walter Tull was actually born in Folkestone in, in Kent to a, to a Barbadian uh, uh, father and a, and a white mother and was, after the uh, death of his parents, was actually brought up in an orphanage in Bethnal Green in East London. But um, actually, through his love of football, and, uh, and the fact that he was very good at it, you know, became a, a, a well-known public figure par prior to the outbreak of the First World War. And in a sense, was the fact that he's a kind of, as I say, a, he's used as a, as a symbolic figure now. In fact, he was very, uh, very unrepresentative of, of, of the average West Indian serviceman. The fact that he kind of had sporting talent was a public was a public figure. He, he, he volunteered for service in the Middlesex uh, Regiment in the, I think it's the 17th uh, Footballers Battalion. So he, he already had a p public persona. He, he, he embodied kind of the, the kind of virtues of, of sporting talent, which, you know, as, as his, uh, those of you who've looked into the, the, the history of the First World War will know how, how significant that is in terms of... Uh, you know, representations of, of the ideal soldier and the ideal sportsman. There's a great deal of crossover in that respect. But this, uh, again, the, the uh, Hallow Turf is a theatre and education uh, production aimed largely at uh, secondary school age uh, young people. And here the cast of the production, it's just a cast of two, uh, are at Molin Molino, the uh, Wolverhampton Wanderers ground for a kind of past meets uh, present photo opportunity but you know in, in a sense you can see why a, f a figure like Walter Toll has become so uh, symbolic and significant I think um, Phil Vasily who's done amazing amounts of research on, on Walter Toll's life over the course of probably 25 or so years is in the course I think of developing a film uh, uh, a major film about his life uh, in 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 the near future, um, but so, something that interested struck me from this play was was a line, and I think in a, in a way it was a kind of throwaway line. I'm not sure if the person who who uh, writing the play, pa Pamela Hudson Cole, intended it in this way. Uh, Walter Toll says to Private Joseph Harper, "Something wrong there, Private." and Private Harper replies, "No, sir, sir. You just look familiar. That's all." I mean, there was a sense that he's familiar to Joseph Harper because Joseph Harper, as it turns out, is a lifelong su a supporter of Northampton Town, and so you think, well, he recognises him because he's a famous footballer, and he's and he's he's watched Walter Toll from the ter terraces, and now finds himself in, in his uh, uh, battalion. But in a sense, there was also. I, I immediately kind of recalled the words of Frantz Fanon in the sense that Fanon suggests that the black man is already known to, to the white observer. He's over-determined uh, from without. And in a sense, these lines are a stark reminder of those words, that this, in a sense, immediately reminds, reminds us of the kind of stereotypes around uh, race the stereotypes of the black man's mental capacity, physical ability, and sexuality, which, for the majority of uh, of uh, West Indian volunteers during the First World War, determined their uh, wartime experiences. These experiences, often of discrimination, which later fed into post 
war discourses of uh, national identity, Pan-African affiliations, and many decades later are still being contested within uh, contemporary British uh, society. And as I suggested at the beginning, you know, West Indian War Service, which initially was for empire, has subsequently be, been claimed by the independent nations of, 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 the, of the British Caribbean territories. It's been claimed by West Indian migrants to Britain, uh, and now, in a sense, it's been reclaimed, as we saw in that memorial service at Glasgow Cathedral, by advocates of, 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 of uh, multicultural Britain. What's always in interested me, uh, and, uh, and th this is the final kind of contemporary rendition of the uh, First World War I'm, I'm going to show. I mean, I'm aware, aware that uh, David Olasaba is speaking here in a couple of weeks, and uh, I've, I've been reviewing his very excellent uh, documentaries on, on the uh, forgotten uh, imperial soldiers of, of the First World War. But... I guess something that struck me was that we're still being presented with a, with a kind of vision of, of the tragic, the, the notion of, of that the, the service of, of the West Indian volunteers has been forgotten, that they were essentially uh, victims of, of racism uh, and, uh, imper and imperialism, rather than looking at some of the other uh, exciting and important elements of their experience which in a way were opportunities for them in the way that the First World War for, for many women represented an opportunity rather than the kind of more tragic representations that we're perhaps uh, used to. So in a sense in this particular sequence uh, D David doesn't particularly touch at length on the, on the experience of West Indian soldiers but when he does, he visits a, a, a war memorial in, in, in Tanzania where there's a, uh, the names of some members of the British West Indies Regiment who died in Tanzania in the campaign uh, against uh, von Letov Vorbeck's uh, German uh, Askaris uh, in the course of 1917 and 1918. And he comments on the kind of irony here of the fact that men from Jamaica, Barbados and other West Indian islands in one of those bizarre twists of history find themselves uh, in Africa fighting for the empire that took their ancestors from this continent and into slavery. And th as I say, this is a kind of an ironic twist, it's a kind of tragic twist that I guess in, in some ways is might equally have been in, at home in uh, Paul Fussell's uh, uh, study of the Great War and uh, modern uh, memory, the, 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 the idea that the war played a huge uh, kind of cruel joke on, on uh, Western civilization. It reverted the notion of, 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 of the onward progress of, of European uh, civilization. And for the West Indian soldiers in this case, those men whose uh, lives are commemorated on this memorial plaque in, in, in Tanzania, the cruel joke for them was that you know their ancestors had been, had been taken from Africa and now they're essentially buried in Africa fighting for the very empire that stole their ancestors from Africa. But at the same time, for me, this kind of overlooks the fact that you know what was the how did those West Indians arriving in Africa actually feel? You know that that, that was an opportunity for a kind of homecoming for them that in 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 many ways was denied the majority of West Indians who by the time of the First World War were starting to look to Africa you know I think you have to look yeah, at, at, at those kind of alternative uh, readings it's not just a tragedy that those men came and fought for empire just as it wasn't a tragedy for those West Indians who arrived in, in, in the Holy Land you know these, these were kind of almost Fulfillments of some of their millennial beliefs, that, and also overlooks the fact that there was also a, an ongoing traffic between the West Indies and Africa from the time of slavery onwards. It wasn't simply a one-way journey. West Indians, 
served as missionaries in, in many parts of West Africa and established, re-established uh, black communities in, in, in West Africa particularly, which then became beacons for uh, uh, African uh, self-government uh, from the mid-19th uh, century onwards. So I think we have to look really, uh, for, from the West Indian perspective, that, 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 that we shouldn't be looking at the First World War simply as, as part of a, of, a, of, a, of a great tragedy. And the, the reason I'm keen to argue that point, because when you look at West, other West Indian accounts of the war, that is certainly not the kind of uh, view of the First World War that is being offered by uh, the, the West Indian uh, veterans. Just thought it'd be useful to go over some of the 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 the, the, the history of, of the the war from a West Indian perspective. Something like sixteen thousand uh, West Indians from all the British colonies in the West Indies, not only the island colonies but also the mainland colonies of. Uh, Belize and uh, then known as British Honduras and uh, Guyana uh, something like 16,000 men uh, were recruited into the British uh, West Indies Regiment a further 12 to 1500 were al already serving with the West India Regiment which was a separate regiment established in the West Indies during the slavery period to fight to garrison uh, the British West Indian territories uh, during the uh, French Revolutionary Wars, uh, and you know when white soldiers were dying in large numbers in the West Indies in the late 18th, 18th century onwards, black slaves were seen as a far better uh, solution to military recruitment. Once slavery was abolished, one of the ways that the garrisons were uh, kept supplied was. When, whenever Britain intercepted a slave ship bound for uh, uh, another European territories, then those freed slaves were often <laughs> forcibly enlisted in the West India Regiment. And so the remnants of the West India Regiment also served in the we uh, First World War uh, uh, as well. There was also West Indians serving in, in the Royal and Merchant Navies in, in significant numbers. And also, uh, West Indians who found themselves in Britain at the outbreak of the war uh, came forward uh, to try and uh, enlist, although their experience uh, was somewhat patchy. Sometimes they were accepted by recruiting officers, other times they were turned away on the grounds that they were um, military law at that time classed black men, even if they were, they were British subjects, classed black men as, as aliens. And so the numbers that could be recruited were limited to something like one in 50 of, of, uh, of, of each uh, military unit and uh, black men could not b rise above the rank of sergeant uh, and so that, that's why Walter Tull is regarded as such an exceptional figure because he reached the rank of second lieutenant although I have, have found evidence of other black officers serving in the course of the First World War that they were by and large very un unusual but at the outbreak of war uh, another kind of key uh, element in terms of uh, West Indian history is the formation of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro uh, Improvement and African Conservation Association actually founded three days before First World War on Emancipation Day, the 1st of August. Um, one of the first uh, acts of, of uh, Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association was in early September to send uh, uh, a, a declaration of loyalty to, uh, to, to the colonial office via the, the, the Jamaican uh, governor. And begging to express our loyalty and devotion uh, to His Majesty the King and Empire and praying for the success of British arms on the battlefields of Europe and Africa and at sea. And it's important to see at this time Marcus Garvey was 
firmly, although he was clearly articulating uh, a sense of black self-improvement and arguing for black civil rights in, in Jamaica, was very much arguing for those within an existing imperial relationship. At that time, he still believed that, in a sense, the imperial relationship could be uh, reformed to allow black self-improvement with a, within uh, an imperial uh, uh, relationship. Although, as, as I'll explore later, he was obviously, by the middle years of the war, was no longer convinced of that position. But obviously, declarations of loyalty such as this weren't unusual at the outbreak of war uh, amongst uh, what we might call subject populations. You know, the many Irish nationalists put the independence struggle on hold to support the war effort, likewise nationalists in India. So... In a sense, it's partly a tactical uh, strategy as well to declare loyalty in the hope that that loyalty will be rewarded uh, in, in the post-war era with those long hoped for uh, political uh, and economic uh, improvements. So, as I said, the Universal Negro Improvement Association is formed on the eve of the war Marcus Garvey issues this uh, pro proclamation uh, of loyalty and really, as I say, anticipating that some support for the imperial cause um, is going to lead to economic and social improvements uh, after the war. <coughs> However, this, this enthusiasm for the war effort was really uh, at odds with... Uh, war office and colonial office policy which directed West Indians to assist the war effort through their continued production of uh, raw, mater uh, raw materials uh, and, and other and staple products for the war effort. So in other words, it, in a, from the colonial office point of view, despite the war, it was business <coughs> as usual for the Caribbean uh, colonies that they needed to continue to produce raw materials, sugar, uh, fruit, timber, even Sea Island cotton, which was later used in the production of aeroplanes. These were, this was seen as the main um, uh, use that the Caribbean colonies could be put to in terms of supporting the war effort. However, you know, there was discontent with this position. You know, this uh, Barbadian uh, correspondent to the West India Committee circular, who would have in a sense being part of the, the, the West India Committee, was really represented the sugar interest in the British West Indies. And uh, this Barbadian correspondent suggested, yeah, we've put up sugar uh, and money. I mean, the, the West Indian colonies uh, uh, put up huge amounts of money to support the war effort through voluntary contributions and uh, increased taxes during the course of, of the First World War. But... Essentially, what people people actually desired to make some kind of sacrifice, not only in support of the war effort itself, but also to assert, in some sense, the ability of of the West Indian colonies to actually uh, the ability for, that they held to be to be capable of uh, self government and at least uh, in, improved. Uh, political uh, representation. Th this close link, really, but th th this this statement such as these were really alluding to the fact that what was at stake here, wh what was, in, in essence, the manhood uh, of, of the West Indian uh, co colonies. That if they were denied the opportunity to fight, that somehow their their uh, their, their, their manhood itself would be would, would be called in, into question. West Indians were, were in fact very eager to enlist, not only in the hope of post-war improvements in the imperial uh, uh, relationship, but as I say, the fact that they would, in the post-war period, be looked down upon uh, as uh, not having pulled their weight in, in, in the war effort. One of the, another aspect of, of um, imperial propaganda at this time was the suggestion that if uh, Germany was successful in, 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 in defeating Britain, that uh, one of the uh, 
one, one of the consequences of that would be that slavery would be re reintroduced I I in the British West Indian territories. And if you look at pro-war rallies and, and later on, once the British West Indies Regiment was finally established in October 1915, time and time again people are saying, are you not man enough to come forward and fight? Do you realise what's going to happen if Britain is defeated? Then the first thing that the Germans will do is that when they land in, in, in Jamaica and other West Indian territories to, is to re-establish uh, slavery. And as I say, it's important to think of slavery as being in the recent memory. There were people alive in the Caribbean at this time who, if they, who were potentially survivors of slavery, which had only been finally abolished in uh, 1838. Uh, so, and certainly people would have had gr uh, parents and grandparents who had been born into slavery at this time. And in, in many ways, the memory of slavery was more recent for, for people in the West Indies than the memory of the First World War is for us now in, in, in contemporary uh, Britain. So the notion that somehow you know, a German victory would reintroduce slavery it, it is a very uh, potent uh, message and it's another reason that uh, West Indians uh, came forward to volunteer uh, for the empire during this time. It might sound like a slightly far-fetched scenario but one of the links that Germany actually had in the Caribbean at this time were, was their support for various uh, regime changes in, in the island of Haiti. German, there were German investors there in terms of, of, of particularly in terms of the uh, coffee industry and trying to establish Haiti, uh, the, re establish the economy of Haiti. There was a lot of German money involved and a lot of German political intrigue. In the eyes of the uh, white establishment in the Caribbean, of course, Haiti embodies the notion of black self government uh, uh, and black uh, insurrection from the time of the Haitian Revolution uh, uh, of 1804. And, and, and so th those two kind of imaginings combined really show why it's, it, it's very plausible in the West Indian context that somehow Germany could potentially launch uh, invasions from the island of Haiti. And in fact, short stories appear, uh, appeared in the, in the Jamaica uh, newspapers, for example, fictitious accounts of this German invasion launched from Haiti using uh, black mercenaries. To, to subdue the West, the British West Indies population. So, very important aspect in terms of encouraging uh, West Indians uh, to volunteer. In the initial stages of the war, as I say, the, the War Office and the Colonial Office rejected uh, West Indian uh, volunteers. Those making their own way to Britain were often ridiculed at recruiting offices. A ca in, in, in some situations they were, did successfully enlist but o over the course of time I, I think the colonial authorities were concerned that if the offer of, of military service wasn't taken up then this would lead to uh, unrest in the, in, in, in the Caribbean people would start to resent the fact that their uh, uh, attempts to enlist had been rejected and a rather ad hoc, ad hoc uh, process developed where colonial governors didn't seem to know what to do when men f came forward to volunteer. They were often held I I in kind of military camps, uh, encampments, providing in, in a sense a, a possibility of unrest if they were just sat around not doing an awful lot. And so initially, uh, eventually by uh, October uh, 1915, by this time George V himself had personally intervened. The British West Indies uh, Regiment was established as an infantry regiment of the British Army, uh, and on the on the key condition that w the the regiment would only be established for the duration of the war only. So this was a temporary measure, but importantly, and um, particularly in the context of the later experience of West Indians, was the fact that it was clearly established as an infantry. Regiment, in other words, a frontline regiment that would be engaged in fighting, and this was the expectation of, of, of the West Indian volunteers themselves. The reality was that, you know, for many of the battalions, uh, they 
actually uh, became uh, used uh, as labour battalions, particularly on the, the Western Front uh, in, in, in France and, and Belgium, later on in the war uh, in Italy. Although, significantly, um, the first two battalions, the first and second battalions, which had started to arrive in Britain from 1915, and the, uh, late 1915, and then were based uh, in the Middle East on, on, uh, for climatic reasons. They, they suggest there was a high rate of uh, mortality amongst the West Indian troops when they first arrived at Seaford on the south coast of England, part, mainly due to the squalid conditions in which they were housed. They were housed in wooden, leaky wooden huts, uh, and, and many succumbed to diseases such as uh, measles and so forth. And there's a, a small uh, Commonwealth war grave cemetery in Seaford itself where a number of West Indian soldiers are, are buried before even uh, heading anywhere near the uh, front line. But for that reason, the, the idea was that you know West Indians can't cope with European weather conditions. They were next located I I in the Middle East, I in uh, Egypt, and used on lines of communication defending railway lines and so forth and initially not used in combat. The later battalions uh, which were sent to uh, France were largely used as I say uh, as labour battalions uh, carrying ammunition up to the big guns, unloading trains, unloading uh, ships, building roads and railways, laying telephone lines, digging te trenches, that kind of <coughs> arduous work um, which involved exposure to the German guns and, and casualties uh, proved that uh, but not being able to fire a shot in anger. The exception to that was uh, the experience as I say of the first and second uh, battalions who eventually uh, came to fight in the, in the, in the Palestine uh, campaign during from 1917 uh, onwards and initially just a small uh, machine gun section uh, was deployed against the Turks but nevertheless Allenby himself who, who was the uh, general commanding the, the uh, Middle East uh, campaign commented on, on, on their performance this is a, 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 a uh, memo that was sent back to the uh, Jamaica colonial government governors uh, saying how well the, the machine gun section had performed against the Turks during the course of July 1917 when they took, in, took part in several raids on the Turkish lines along uh, the Gaza Beersheba uh, line as I said <laughs> I've started to be start to reflect really on, on, on the significance for these men of actually serving in the Holy Land. And something that struck home to me particularly clearly uh, was, was recently when I met the writer Donald Hines. Um, he's a, a, a novelist. He's wrote, wrote, written an account of his early life in Britain as a bus conductor entitled Journey to an Illusion. And um, I met him recently. In fact, he in introduced one of my talks uh, at, um, at a First World War event. And he, he, he recounted this memory that he had as a, as a, as a teenage boy. He visited the, um, what was then the new university hospital at Mona uh, in Jamaica with his uh, grandmother who'd raised him. She was attending the new hospital where he met a, a veteran of the British West Indies Regiment who immediately came up to him uh, and said, Young man, during the First World War I, I knelt down and drank from the River Jordan. You know, and the fact that this man introduced himself in those terms starts to provide a kind of clue to the, to the far greater significance that transcends empire in many ways of, of, of these, for these West Indian soldiers when they arrive in the Holy Lands. And they were actually fighting in some of the, you know, in, in areas that are described in, 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 in battles of, of the biblical era and in fact in, 19, in 1918 September 1918 they actually take part in 
the, the Battle of Megadu, which is cited on the ancient uh, on the uh, on the reputed site of the ancient Battle of, of Armageddon, which within Jamaican uh, and and other West Indian millennial tradition is, is highly significant. And it's interesting at this time that uh, many. So, so, some writers within the Caribbean were actually taking note of those kind of events, that the, they were starting to regard the First World War uh, as, as what was termed a sign of the times, a sign uh, of, of a new millennia and the breaking up of, a, of, a, of, the, uh, ancient, of the old imperial order and its replacement with if essentially a new uh, kingdom on earth which essentially meant uh, black uh, self-government and um, uh, I guess preeminent amongst these figures were, were, was a, a Jamaican uh, Isaac Edmondson Barnes who wrote a, a, a pamphlet The Signs of the Times in 1903 uh, shortly after the Boer War when British imperial power was starting to be called into question in which he noted the rise of the non-European powers such as Japan and, 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 and suggested this was a time of, of, of great reckoning when the old imperial order would be overthrown. So in the context of those kind of uh, representations it, it's important to look at the experiences of the West Indians serving in the First World War uh, uh, as really, as I said, as transcending some of these um, uh, the, uh, the limits of empire, really. Unfortunately, um, you know, despite what were regarded uh, as the heroic exploits of the West Indians in, in the liberation of the Holy Land, and reports started to reach the West Indian newspapers of heroic ba uh, bayonet charges, particularly at the back Battle of Megadu, um, these heroic accomplishments weren't recognised in, in terms of the way the West Indians were treated by the uh, British military uh, authorities. Throughout the duration of the war, many of the battalions uh, you know, suffered uh, inferior recreational and uh, medical facilities, for example. They were often uh, uh, segregated from white troops. They weren't allowed to socialise uh, with local civilian uh, populations. And when the British Army was awarded a pay increase uh, in 1917, I think the, the, the pay of the private soldier rose from a shilling a day to one and sixpence. This, off, this pay increase uh, was not uh, granted to the, West Indi to the British West Indies Regiment, even though, as I said, at the, at the, st at the outset, they were established as a British Army Infantry Regiment. Uh, military officials started to resort to the idea that they were ra uh, they were in fact a native regiment and so they weren't subject to the same terms and conditions uh, as the rest of the British Army. Although later in the war uh, the, the, the pay increase after <coughs> many process was, uh, was eventually granted, nevertheless it showed the attitude of, of those in power in the, in the military hierarchy who did not, even when the, 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 the black men had, uh, had proven themselves on the front line that uh, they did not merit, they weren't seen as meriting the same pay increases as the, the remainder of, of the British uh, army. Nevertheless, yeah, their participation in, in, in the war was, was <laughs> used to, to demonstrate that, that the empire was this you know, force for good and this uh, force for, uh, for unity. And this is an account by William Massey, who was a, uh, a British newspaper correspondent who covered the uh, Middle Eastern campaigns. He wrote several books including how Jerusalem was won, he wrote, uh, and, uh, and also an account on uh, Allenby's um, capture of, of uh, Jerusalem in 1917. 
and it, he remarks here from all over the seven seas the empire's sons came to illustrate the u- unanimity of all the king's subjects our dark-skinned brethren in the west indies furnished infantry who when the fierce summer heat made the air in the jordan valley like a draught from a furnace had a bayonet charge which aroused an anzac brigade to enthusiasm and of course colonial free men can estimate bravery at its true value there's a kind of several <laughs> stereotypical representations going on in, in, in this in, in this paragraph but the, I guess the most important thing is that it's stressing West Indian invo- involvement uh, 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 as you know demonstrating uh, imperial unity uh, uh, and uh, you know the equality of all fighting men in the eyes of, of, of empire and this bayonet charge starts to become very significant and, and symbolic within discourses of nationalism after the First World War, despite the experiences of the majority of West Indian soldiers, uh, as I said, serving as labourers, the fourteen of the of, of, of sorry, ten of the twelve West Indian battalions uh, were largely deployed as labour battalions. Despite that, this rather heroic rendition this, uh, uh, and their heroic bayonet charge in, in the Middle Eastern campaign assumes the most uh, significance in terms of the West Indian memory of, of the First World War. And it's something that time and time again, during the course of the 1920s and the 1930s, as uh, calls for greater self-government and calls for improvements in the, in the social and economic conditions of the Jamaican peasantry and working class uh, as those calls are raised, so too are, are, are the memories of, of this uh, heroic uh, bayonet charge of the 1st and 2nd Battalions uh, in the Jordan Valley. After the war itself, you know, the, the, and during the, de- the demobilisation period, the, the, the West Indian Battalions are uh, congregated for demobilisation at Taranto, in, in, in Italy, which was a kind of staging post uh, for the Middle East uh, campaign. And it was during this time, really, that grievances uh, really came to a head, the fact that they'd been uh, ill-treated and discriminated against, particularly in terms of, of pay and conditions. And this starts to come to a head, particularly when wage and ration improvements were granted to... Uh, unruly Italian and Maltese labourers employed by the British while Western, uh, West Indian troops uh, continued to feel humiliated by the harsh discipline and increasingly menial duties they were expected to perform. So at Taranto in Italy where the British were employing a variety of local labourers uh, and Maltese, Egyptians and so forth many of these uh, groups of men were increasingly restive and were demanding uh, pay increases, which the British Army seemed to be happy to to give to them, where at the, at the same time the West Indian soldiers, many of whom uh, had seen frontline service by this time, were increasingly being told to t- undertake menial duties. So, for at one point, one of, one of the West Indian battalions was actually asked to clean out the latrines used by Italian labourers, and this seemed to be the final straw which uh, uh, resulted in, in a mutinous outbreak uh, on the 6th of December 1918 where uh, uh, a battalion of the Worcester Regiment was actually sent to suppress the mutiny all the West Indian battalions were forcibly uh, disarmed and something around 50 men were found guilty of, in, of involvement in mutiny or disobeying orders at, uh, at courts martial established by the British. One man was even sentenced to death but his uh, uh, sentence was subsequently reduced to 25 years uh, uh, imprisonment. In the wake of the mutiny uh, a group of uh, NCOs, British West Indian NCOs formed the Caribbean League at Taranto to discuss all matters conducive to the welfare of the West Indian Islands and, uh, uh, and to 
and, and pledging themselves really in, in, in once they were demobilised to, to, to bring about improvements in social and economic uh, conditions in the British uh, West Indian uh, territories. And this um, poem by H.B. Uh, Monteith really kind of highlights the kind of mood that was uh, starting to emerge amongst some of the veterans at this time. H.B. Monteith was actually a teacher in, in civilian life prior to enlisting in the British West Indies Regiment and um, submitted this poem to the Jamaica Times, which was a significant newspaper in terms of promoting the emerging literary talent of Jamaica uh, during the First World War uh, uh, and beyond. But really this poem, Lads of the West, embodies that whole notion that men from the West Indies were no longer think, thinking of themselves in, in terms of distinctive <coughs> island identities. They no longer thought of themselves as uh, Jamaicans or, or Barbadians, or, but felt themselves uh, in terms of having a West Indian identity, which in many ways can be seen as mirroring uh, the experience of West Indians once they arrived in London in the 1940s and 1950s. The kind of small island mentality was eroded to some extent by the experiences of military service uh, and migration and, and, and poems such as these really embody uh, that, that notion of a West Indian identity but also about really no, no longer sacrificing themselves for the empire but looking forward to, to a time uh, of uh, self-government and and, incre and really uh, black self-respect, black self-confidence uh, and the notion of any future sacrifices should be made uh, in for social equality rather than, uh, rather than uh, the empire. It's interesting, another sort of strand at this time that's important to, to, to recognise is Similar kind of approaches to the war were, were taking place in the, in the United States at this time. Um, this is a, p a poem that appeared in the crisis, of the uh, publication of the, of the National Association for the Advancement of Coloured People. The, the crisis was, was their uh, monthly journal, and in, in uh, June 1918 they produced a special so uh, soldiers issue to... Uh, recognise the uh, involvement of, of black American soldiers in, in the war effort. And it's interesting that you know, uh, organisations such as the NAACP were advocating that black men come and enlist in order to earn post-war reward in, much as, in a very similar way to the way advocates of black, uh, of rec black recruitment were arguing in, in the West Indies at that time. Also important was the fact that many West Indians themselves had actually migrated to the United States in search of employment. So they were not only exposed to, to the messages uh, of, of Garvey in Jamaica, but also uh, exposed to, the, to, to black radical ideas in the United States. And indeed, by 1960, Marcus Garvey himself had decided that the US was a far more fertile ground for arguing for black uh, self improvement so this is this is an important uh, an important aspect really of, of uh, emerging black consciousness in in the Caribbean and in the united states and and, and really in terms of of, of pan africanism and a kind of global black identity that is transcending the boundaries of, of uh, empire from the point of view of the British army when the u s enters the war in April 1917, the British are <coughs> allowed to recruit a British subjects living in the US. And so black West Indians were starting to come forward to the British military missions in, in cities such as New York to enlist in British Army regiments. They no longer were being sent directly to the British West Indies Regiment. There's increasing evidence that significant numbers of black West Indians were entering uh, British Army regiments via the British military mission in New York. There's a 
a lengthy correspondence between British military officials and the War Office about what do we do? <laughs> we didn't expect black people to be coming forward to volunteer. Well, they made the assumption that British subjects living in the US would, be, would have been white. But in fact, many West Indians were living there, which promote, you know, created a, f a fresh problem as far as the War Office was concerned. But there's at least photographic evidence that, that you know, black men were starting to appear in significant numbers in uh, British Army regiments other than the British West Indies Regiment. As I say, you know, I, I've given a particular West Indian example, the, the, the example of a, of a West Indian volunteer, H.B. Monteith, who's reflecting on his wartime experiences. And also, by the latter years of the war, you know, Marcus Garvey's taking up this notion of, of, of a really what we might call a blood sacrifice um, on behalf of, you know, the African people and people of African descent uh, by... Uh, th this uh, stage of the war. So, January nineteen nineteen, he's talking about Africa becoming a bloody sac, uh, a, a bloody black battlefield. I mean, in a sense, an irony of this is that Africa had all, as we've seen from recent studies and uh, uh, David Olasuga's uh, broadcast, cl clearly show that you know throughout the First World War itself, Africa was. Uh, 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 a place of, of death and destruction where literally hundreds of thousands of Africans uh, were laying down their lives for the uh, for both sides it, 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 during the First World War. But Garvey was saying that any future sacrifices should be on behalf of African self-determination uh, and should mean victory for the Negro standard rather than uh, uh, sacrifice uh, for empire. And really... Garvey here is drawing on some of the sentiments of Irish nationalism of this of, of this time. If you look at the uh, uh, pa Patrick Pierce's graveside oration at the funeral of O'Donovan Rosser in 1915, he's talking in terms of life springing from death and from the graves of, of patriots, of patriotic men and women. Nations are born. So there's this notion uh, and. It, you know, Garvey himself was highly influenced by uh, uh, the Irish nationalism of this time. In fact, uh, named the uh, headquarter, the New York headquarters of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, Liberty Hall, after uh, uh, the uh, Irish nationalist headquarters in, in, in Dublin. So th th those those links are, are particularly uh, significant. Again, you know, during the, the 1920s, the, the Universal Ethiopian, Ethiopian Anthem, which is the kind of anthem of uh, uh, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, kind of captures this notion of military sacrifice for uh, Africans across the globe, no longer for empire. This is about sacrifice for, uh, for Africa uh, uh, behind the standard of the, of, of the red, black and, and green flag. <coughs> of the Universal Negro Improvement Association. But, you know, embodying the rhetoric and symbolism that we perhaps might associate with the uh, British uh, imperial uh, slogans of, of the time. We also, during the 20s and 30s, up. What starts to emerge is the per the figure of what I would call the permanent West Indian soldier. We're perhaps familiar with the notion of the permanent German soldier, the sense that amongst many Germans after the First World War that they'd kind of been stabbed in stabbed in the back by polit politicians. They hadn't really been defeated. That, you know, Britain and France and the U.S. hadn't formally invaded Germany, although the Rhineland was occupied by France with, with uh, black Senegalese uh, troops I during uh, 1920. Nevertheless, in a sense, Germ Germany hadn't really uh, formally been conquered. And the, 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 within the, the German uh, fascist uh, organisations of the 20s and onwards, the notion was of Germans who were, con who 
the veterans of the First World War were permanent soldiers who were going to carry on, on, on the struggle uh, for, uh, you know, for the German nation. And likewise, there is a sense of what I would call a permanent West Indian soldier. Some of the veterans become involved in, in the, what I would call the paramilitary wings of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association. This uh, uh, figure here, St. William Grant, was uh, a Jamaican who served in the First World War. Uh, after the First World War, like many other West Indians, he migrated. Uh, some, many West Indians were given special passes to go and cut sugar in, in, in Cuba. It was an excellent opportunity of disturbing, uh, of dispersing uh, potentially unruly elements. Others, such as St. William Grant, went uh, to the United States in search of work. And, and many, such as St. William Grant, become involved in, in uh, black activism in the United States. And St. William Grant himself establishes uh, what was called the Tiger Division of the Universal African legions, which were the kind of paramilitary wing of Marcus Garvey's Universal Negro Improvement Association, and um, gave short shrift actually to uh, in a very uh, on the on the streets of New York on on the, in the black metropolis of Harlem. Any opponents of Garvey, uh, particularly black communists, were given a bit of a rough time. On, on the streets of Harlem by uh, these Garveyite uh, West Indian veterans. And the interesting thing about them, there's a, there's a picture of St. William Grant from the 1930s, 1938 in Jamaica, by which time he'd, he'd, re he'd been deported from the US, returned to Jamaica, and took part in the Jamaica Labour Rebellion of 1938. And this was a similar route taken by many West Indian veterans of the First World War. They might have dispersed immediately after the First World War, after the Great Depression of the 1920s and 30s had taken hold. They, they were often forced to return to their home islands uh, and took part in the political disturbances during that time, uh, which were centred around really uh, you know, the crisis in the sugar industry uh, and the increasingly uh, uncertain conditions of life for the majority of the working class in, in the West Indies and, and the West Indian peasantry also. But what's interesting about him is that, you know, he's, he might be a pan-Africanist, he might be a paramilitary for Marcus Garvey's organisations, but he's still wearing his British War and Victory Medals, which he carried on doing until his death in 1977. So this is the kind of interesting, how can I say process in the development of, of the West Indian War memory. These men had initially enlisted for empire, but their military service was used, uh, you know, to, in, in, a, in a way to justify their involvement in, 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 in Pan-Africanism and to give them status within the Pan-African movements with these kind of quasi-military uh, uniforms also. Just finally want to close, really, on, on what I would call the shifting geographies of commemoration. And, and really, I've talked about, in, in temporal terms, you know, the notion that you know, West Indians fought for empire, their military service was subsequently uh, enlisted by nationalist organisations, by pan-African organisations. And in a way, this is reflected in the way... The, very, the, the geographical shift in, in the Jamaica War Memorial, which in 1922 was unveiled in Church Street, uh, Kingston, Jamaica, um, on, uh, on Armistice Day, uh, no, 11th of November 1922. Subsequently, uh, after the death of George, George VI in 1953, a, a new public park was opened in Jamaica called George VI Memorial Gardens and the war memorial was taken wholesale dismantled and taken wholesale there in the post-independence period uh, George VI Memorial Gardens has been renamed National Heroes Park where 
figures such as Marcus Garvey and um, Bob Marley are interred. And um, but nevertheless, yeah, the, 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 this is a, a recent picture of you know the uh, guard duty being undertaken of the Jamaica War Memorial, where you know the the, the members of the Jamaica Defence Force are very much dressed in the uniforms that kind of recall the earlier imperial uh, relationships. And um, I think I'll, I'll close on that note today, just to, just to kind of really show how, although I've, I started off talking about the kind of shifts of West Indian war memory that are taking place within contemporary uh, television and theatrical,